ಓಂ ಜ್ಞಾನತಿಮಿರಂದ್ಯಾನಂಜನ ಶಲಾಕಾಯ ಚಕ್ಷುರುನ್ಮಿಲಿಥೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುವೇ ನಮ ಐ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಮೈ ರೆಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟ್ಫುಲ್ ಬೇಸನ್ಸ್ ಟು ಇಸ್ ದಿವೈನ್ ಗ್ರೇಸ್ ಐ ಸಿ ಭಕ್ತಿವಿರಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಪ್ರಭುಪಾದ್ ಮೈ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಲ್ ಮಾಸ್ಟರ್ ಹೂ ಸೇವ್ ಮೀ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದಿ ಡಾರ್ಕೆಸ್ಟ್ ರೀಜನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಗ್ನೋರೆನ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಟು ಆಲ್ ದ ಡಿವೋಟೀಸ್ ಹೂ ಆರ್ ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಟುಡೇ um i recognize many of you and um very glad to see you and i don't recognize many more of you and i'm very glad to see you too <laughs> and it's it's always a pleasure to be here in this in this uh temple i spent some time here in the early days and uh feel <coughs> more than a little bit of nostalgia being here and remembering um uh, Oh my god brother try to do things that I really can have no that I have no access to and that I don't have any control over This is one of the ways that I can um this is one of the ways people feel anxiety in their lives is trying to do things that are out of reach and thinking about which kinds of things are out of reach one could collect a lot of uh, different items that i actually have no control over and as as i systematically set those things aside and say i really have no control over these things why am i dwelling on them and why am i trying to control them i i lessen my sense of anxiety and i become more effective that's the practical side of this discussion about being an instrument So what does it really mean to be an instrument? It means to understand in terms of Bhagavad Gita who I actually am and what is my purpose. That often solves problems in most realms. For instance, in the realm of business and corporate management, there's always a bent towards coming back and describing what one's purpose is in fact most people who teach management say that the best way to start an enterprise is to first define what one's purpose is one such advocate his name guy kawasaki guy kawasaki was one of the founders of apple corporation and since then he started many successful companies and has become a consultant in that and he wrote a book called called The Art of the Start and in it he gives the three first steps for starting any kind of successful enterprise the first he says is make meaning second is make mantra the third is get going so the first one make meaning means to decide why you're doing something and the mantra means to have something to describe what your main mission is and the third is to start doing it because you can take progress over perfection you can fix a lot of things as you go along but if you don't know why you're doing it then you can really run into trouble because people get all kinds of ideas about different ways to do it but if you come back to your original meaning and you find that it's an authorized and reasonable way to be doing things then you can feel confident and moving forward towards your goal in the way that you should be so in the gita krishna talks about understanding who we are and that is that we're part of him in the 15th chapter of the gita krishna says mai mai vamsho jiva loke jiva bhuta sanatana manakshashta nindrayani prakriti stadi karshati this could be a useful verse for this whole topic because here Krishna tells us that we are parts of him. And then he says that we're struggling with the mind and the senses. And elsewhere there are descriptions in the Gita and also in the Shrimad Bhagavatam describing why such a struggle would go on with the mind and the senses. And it has to do with what I mentioned in the beginning is that not knowing my mission So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu 
gave a very clear idea of mission for all living entities, which could solve a lot of problems. And that is, understand one's constitutional position. So he said that the constitutional position of a living entity, and really the, the definition of a living entity is given in the Vedas, nityo nityanam, everyone say. That means there's a supreme controller and I'm not him. That helps a lot. <laughs> if you can discern that I'm not the supreme controller, but, and, and at the same time understand that there is a supreme controller, then you're more than halfway there in the process of devotional service. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu advocated for this principle. He taught uh, Rupa Goswami, Sanatana Goswami, very simple mantra. He said, understand that you are the servant of the Supreme. And many of the teachers who have come in the line of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu have re-emphasized this principle as a way of aligning oneself in such a way that one can have not only a productive but a very happy life. For instance, Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, Jeev Krishna das e bishwas koileto artu konai. He says, if you just admit this fact, and more than admit, but actually embrace the simple concept that I'm the servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, then you'll have no more misery in life. Does that sound too simple? Does it? It sounds too simple. It's not. It's, it's really not. <laughs> it's, it actually works. And uh, oftentimes the simplest things are the things that work the best. It's like a light switch. You just flip it, it goes on. And then you see. And so one really would, who investigates this and sees what the actual situation is, will really have no objection to admitting to a supreme controller, a supreme maintainer, who's, um, and if one goes a little further, introspects and also studies the nature of that Supreme, could understand it. he's the perfect moral agent and also he's the most uh, kind and munificent and he's maintaining everybody. One could actually become attached to the idea of serving such a, such a kind, benevolent, moral, uh, amazing, beautiful, a being. And this is the idea of Krishna consciousness. So if one could triangulate and come to this understanding, then it's easy to understand how the principle of being an instrument also works. And in a practical way, I've noticed that there are a lot of tasks in life that seem daunting. Have you noticed that also? Anyone? Yes. Three people in the front. <laughs> what I, but what I mean by that is oftentimes I'm asked to do something and I'm not really sure how to do it. Has that ever happened to anybody? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. We were just, I was talking earlier um, to Ananda Vrindavan about the, the, uh, you know, the whole genre of being a temple president. And, there's a lot that's asked of you, and you don't know what's going to happen next. Of course, none of us do. We're not clairvoyant. We don't know what's going to happen next in our life. And when we do duties, we're, we're not sure what the outcome's going to be. That's for sure. People try to understand it in different ways, but they, they really can't. And oftentimes, uh, whatever we think is going to happen uh, gets reversed, and the opposite happens. That's disconcerting. Right? Yeah. So, the Gita, in the Gita, Krishna deals with this conundrum by saying you don't have to deal with that part. You can take the first part, which is that you're the servant of a master who knows everything. And Krishna claims this in the Bhagavad Gita. He says that I know everything. That Vedaham uh, samatitani vartamanani charjana bhavishyani chabutani I'm too vain and Kashchana. Basically, he's saying, I know everything. I mean, we meet people all the time that say that. 
<laughs> we met a man when we were going door to door showing the Bhagavad Gita and basically explaining the principle that I'm talking about now. He came out of his apartment and in a bathrobe at 11 in the morning and when I showed him the Bhagavad Gita and he said, I know everything. <laughs> so I, I called all the other devotees there to meet him because I wanted to, <laughs> to take advantage. <laughs> he was a little taken aback. <laughs> so apparently he overstated the case. But Krishna really does know everything. And he knows what the outcomes are going to be. And not only that, he has uh, ways of controlling the outcomes as well. And so taking the approach in one's tasks in life of, of leaving it up to Krishna, what the outcome is going to be, is reasonable. And actually thinking that I can control the outcome is unreasonable and that, that could cause some anxiety. Because if I, if I try to control the outcomes that I'm endeavoring for in life then, and it's outside of my reach, then obviously it would be anxiety producing. So Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that uh, you really don't have a right to the result of your work. He also says that uh, you shouldn't be unattached from your work either. You have a right to perform your prescribed duty, but you don't have a right to the fruit of that duty. And neither should you be detached from your duty altogether. You shouldn't just give it up. And this verse indicates uh, this idea of, of being an instrument. So one might say, well, that sounds like kind of a stark existence. What do I actually, Krishna's body. It, it's attached to the body, hopefully. Right? <laughs> Looks pretty attached. And so, sangha, a sangha means that you make a connection. And so, when I, for instance, I look out in the world, I look at some object and I'll think, that's, that's for me. What would I look at and think like that? Give me an example. What's something you could become attached to? A car? That's a good example because cars tend to be status symbols in the world. And, and you know, if you, go to, if you go to buy a car, someone might you know, help you along in buying it and paying high-end retail at that. Guru Prasad. They say, Guru Prasad, this car is really you. And then I can imagine myself driving in the car and like, you know, what is um, Andy going to think when I drive by? <laughs> Because, you know, he saw me at the temple, and I'll be leaning out the window a little bit. <laughs> car's red. I always wanted a red car. He said, this car is really me. And, and that's why I develop a sangha. It, it becomes me. It's just a car, but then because I invest myself in it, it instead of being a car, it becomes my car. And then I, I, I actually take possession of it. It becomes one of my angas, and I have to carry it around. It's like, what is that? It's my car. And... What do you do with your car? You park it way outside so nobody scratches it. <laughs> and then you worry about it. You have to carry it around wherever you go. And th these kinds of encumbrances uh, can be collected here, there, and everywhere. The whole world can be a place for collecting such encumbrances. But these uh, kinds of verses that were given very directly by Krishna that at first seem stark actually... Um, are a way of us divesting these problems from our life and living in, in our real life, which means to experience joy at every second by working for a higher cause. That's what really makes people happy. Even in the secular world, when somebody's working for a higher cause, other, it, it takes them outside the scope of, of their limited mind and they feel good about themselves. That's why Dale Carnegie in his book, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living, which is a must for temple presidents, um, says that when you experience a, a setback in your life and you're worried about it, one of the best things you can do is go out and do some selfless service for somebody else. It actually takes you out of that small concept of I'm oppressed by the material world and brings you into the 
freedom of, of being an eternal servant of Krishna. So what to speak of those who understand who the ultimate benefactor is and the one uh, to whom, when one gives one's energies and one's attention, uh, one gets the greatest reciprocation. If one can understand that secret in life, then the impetus to become an instrument and simply work for that person becomes compelling. And that's devotional service. And from any situation in life, one can work in that way and feel very satisfied as being an instrument. In a practical way, when I teach book distribution, I show devotees the, the joy of going out and meeting other people and introducing them to the Bhagavad Gita as an example. And sometimes the prospect of going out into the great unknown world becomes a scary, isn't it? Say yes. 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 I mean, I've been doing it for 45 years and I s still have trepidation when I go out the door because you don't know what's going to happen. Living entities like to know what's going to happen next. <laughs> but what I teach uh, devotees is to become an instrument. Don't do it for yourself. Don't do it for the result. Don't think that you have to perform. And turn off your mind. Do you know how to do that? Three people said no. Anybody else, do you know how to do it? You want me to teach you? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. I want you to reach behind your head, <laughs> right at the base of your neck. No, I'm serious. There's a switch back there. Check. <laughs> Check it out. Really, I'm serious. Put your hand back there. Yeah, find it. You didn't know it was there. There's a, put your hand behind. I'm trying to find this. Hand. Okay. There's a little switch back there, and when you switch it, you turn from a, uh, a person who's worried about outcomes, who wants to perform to show how good they are in the world, to someone who's simply an instrument. And you don't, you don't care about the result anymore. You only care about doing your duty to the best of your ability. Okay, when I say three, flip the switch. One, two, three, flip. <laughs> Doesn't that feel better? <laughs> yeah, and you can do that at any time. So, at, at, during those incidents where you, you feel yourself slipping into the anxiety of trying to control the world, trying to own the world, trying to be the center of attention, reach back for that switch and turn it. And go from being a, a worried-filled uh, small human into an unlimited servant of the Lord, just like Hanuman. He serves the Lord unlimitedly. His main purpose in life is just to serve Lord Ram. He has no other interest at all. But he's the most celebrated of, of the devotees all over the world. Because he'll go anywhere, do anything. And in this, he always feels happiness and joy. So if, if one simply remembers this principle, based on the reasonable facts that I gave you, and citations from bona fide scripture, then one's life will be happy, just as Bhaktivinoda Thakur says. Just make this proclamation. I am a servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna. I am a servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna. And essentially, when we chant Hare Krishna, we're saying the same thing. I am a servant of Krishna, and I'm praying, please engage me in this service, in your service. And from that, we actually gain real happiness. It seems altogether too simple, but it works. And anyone can try it. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. And now, um, I think your protocol here is first to take questions and then to take reflections. Is that the way you do it, Raja Bihari? Yes. Oh, Ananda Vrindavan? <laughs> first questions and then reflections? Sure. No, whichever way you do it. May I want <laughs> really? We do one question from the next side, one from the lady's side. You tell them what to do and I'll sit here and do I'm gonna be an instrument in this case. <laughs> I'm flipping the switch. <laughs> a question from either side and um, you can have a quick reflection and, and a question. We just like to try to 
try to create enough space for many, many questions. So uh, let's start over here on this side. We'll do gentlemen first. Hare Krishna, Hare Das. Hare Das Das is my old friend. He wasn't asking a question, but I just said hi. <laughs> <laughs> Questions are hard, though, aren't they? He'll take it. <laughs> so, Prabhu, you said that um, the, it's, it's, you can the object of attachment. Uh, so if you look at it more closely or more deeply, it is really coming from the fact that I am this body and my existence is independent of the existence of others. Whereas we subtly realize in a sense that that is not the case. There is a deeper entity, which is kind of a connecting force. But it is not easy to get established in, the, in that truth. And if, if one understands that fully, well, not really from the intellect, I don't know if, if it's even possible to understand it fully from the intellect, but one has to understand it, only then that detachment in the real sense is possible. Not really detachment or, I mean, the, the freedom from attachment is really possible, only then. Is that a question or a reflection? No, I, it's, it's, I'm, why is it so hard? I mean, because it's once we go out to lead our routine lives, uh, we just get pulled pulled into uh, different things by our desire. We just had a Black Friday and we want to buy so many things. People are continuously doing it on a daily basis. So, what? how does one get truly realize this truth? You have to practice. It takes a little practice and it takes a little insight also. It helps when you hear about it, doesn't it? Is just talking about it. For instance, the, the, the very direct statement that everything animate or inanimate within the universe is controlled and owned by the Lord. How does that strike you? Huh? It's profound, amazing. Somebody went like this. What else? What does it do for you besides just describing it? You get, it makes you feel relief? It makes you humble? Well, it's something that can be you, one can think about and practice in one's life and see for oneself. Because this is the actual case, it's actually a relief to, to take this as a axiomatic truth and then try to apply it to the world. And it's not so hard. It's actually easier than one might think. It's a simple principle, but it, it does take practice. Therefore, hearing about this in the association of others who are cultivating that kind of understanding is very helpful. That's why we have a society, so we can get together and hear. So we recommend hearing from Bhagavad Gita regularly. In, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains uh, our existential position in such a commonsensical way that it's, it's easy to adopt it in one's life and become a follower of Krishna. And uh, that's why uh, Bhagavad Gita is so prevalent in the world. People find it to be very reasonable. And devotees get, those who are devotees of Lord Krishna, feel inspired because they're hearing the direct words of Krishna. He explains these things from different angles so that one can accommodate them in one's life. So I, I'm just, as you can see, I'm, I'm moving towards a definitive answer. But the answer I'd like to give right now, in a practical way, is that everyone should read the Bhagavad Gita every day. Prabhupada recommended that, that devotees who are his followers read at least one chapter a day. Now that wouldn't hurt, would it? That's, I'm asking you a serious question. Would it hurt to no. read it? No. Yeah, it, it could actually improve things, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if one tries to read one chapter of Bhagavad Gita a day and hear what Krishna has to say, one might find that it's easier than one might think. So that, that will definitely help. I... I'm making that my final answer. You read the Bhagavad Gita every single day and try to regulate it to at least one chapter a day. 
And Krishna will, will give you, uh, reinforce your impetus to uh, act as an instrument. Practical, right? Yes. Okay. And see me after for, you can get, uh, uh, Brajabrihari has said that there's, uh, uh, there are cases of Bhagavad Gita <laughs> sitting and they're available for everybody. So one of the practices that you can do is read Bhagavad Gita every day and give a Bhagavad Gita every day for the next 108 days. Yeah. <laughs> is that good? Yeah. That's a discipline everyone can take starting today. 108 Gitas, give one every day, and read one chapter every day. Brajri Bihari? Is that authorized? Yes. Okay, it's authorized. Okay, so see him afterwards. You can get your 108 Gitas and do your chapter a day. Uh, question over here. Question. Yes. Your class really resonated with me at multiple levels. Um, the question I had was, um, I, I understand the fact about trying to be an instrument, but when I have an interaction with somebody and say something hurts my ego, in that moment, how do I see that they are being an instrument for my purification? Well, if you prepare yourself for such situations, then, then the blow to your ego can be a little less. It takes practice. And again, the same principle of hearing about our actual situation in life, which is altogether available, especially through Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, is very helpful. After all, Lord Chaitanya said that one should be as humble as, as grass, more tolerant than a tree, and be ready to offer all respects to others. How are you going to get ready for that? And how are you going to be ready to not take respect from others? You really have to think about it. It can't be artificial, but you have to try it at a, at a very deep level. And you may fail repeatedly, but if you're endeavoring for it, at least you can, you can see the ways in which you failed to, to see in that way. And, and you can analyze yourself and see, why did this actually hurt me? And you can see, oh, the false ego is there. For instance, if someone rejects you, what is actually happening? In fact, there's... There's a book I read about this called the, the Four Agreements, and in it, the author said that one thing you should do is never take anything personally. Because people say things to you all the time based on their own mode of existence. They may be passionate, in a passionate mode, and you're not moving fast enough for them on the roadway, for instance, so they may say something as they drive by. But that's not necessarily your problem. That's their... That's their um, frame of reference. So y if you look at things in more of an objective way and also consider that um, the servant uh, of the Lord does the best thing, best that he or she can and uh, whatever complaints one has after that are, are not meant for you. For instance, Prabhupada used to talk uh, in stern language about uh, ways in which people might conduct themselves in the world. And then he would attribute it to Krishna. For instance, you know, he'd talk about working very hard in life with no aim and simply trying to get some meager sense gratification. In the Bhagavad Gita, what does Krishna say this is? What does he call such Muda. a person? Muda. Muda, that's a pretty heavy thing to call somebody. So when Prabhupada called out several times to, to that kind of person and said, this type of life is, re resembles a, a, a donkey or an ass. Someone might complain and said, how can you say that? He said, I'm not saying. Krishna is saying. I'm just repeating. In fact, this, this is the, the way in which um, he asked everyone to become instruments is, and understand what the philosophy is and then repeat it. And do the best you can in your life to understand it and then put it into practice. For instance, I mentioned driving. Is there road rage in this area? There's none? This is the center of road rage. Well, we devised a means when we're, when we're driving, that is when Nirkula and I are driving and, it, and maybe somebody cuts us off. Nirkula, what do I, what's my mantra? I forgive you. I forgive you. You know, they, somebody may honk or anger. It doesn't happen very often. But immediately we say, I forgive you. And we just, we just let it go. So you have to put ways in place of, of 
coming back to the center, which is I am a servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And as another example, Judd Bharat, we're just reading about him. He was asked to carry a palanquin and for a king. And he was jostling the palanquin because he was trying not to step on ants. And then the king berated him, seriously. And afterwards he had a discussion with the king. And he said, you know, you tried to berate me, but you were only talking about the physical body, which I'm not. So I, I really don't take it personally. Although it's not a good idea on your part, he suggested, to, to become so angry about these types of things. So one has to take a, a, a level approach to life, some practical ways in which to, to fortify oneself from overreacting and become introspective. Yes. Do you have a hand up? Are you an expert? Partially it's answered. Wait for the mic. Thanks for me. I know. But it's on the internet, so they have to hear you. Uh, earlier you said uh, what, what that Kawasaki's uh, three things, meaning mantra and go do it. Yeah. Uh, and meaning you explained as uh, being the instrument of being the servant of uh, Krishna. Well, I, yeah, okay, okay. yes. Um, so I'm trying to identify that a little bit. Can you elaborate a little bit more on practical? Now? You did say something. Sure. Well, one may, for instance, have a, a job in the corporate world. Prabhupada mentions this in the 18th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. And you're obligated to go do this work because you have to support yourself and your family, right? And Prabhupada says, quoting Acharyas, that one should think that I'm doing this work for the Supreme Person. This is the prescribed work given to me by the Supreme Personality of God. I'm doing it on his behalf. One should consider like that, that keep that context. Even as one uh, so-called works in the world, outside the context of devotional service, which is what most people have to do. You should still consider, I'm doing this for the Supreme Personality of God. And if you want to make it more real, then Krishna suggests, uh, give the fruits of your labor to Krishna. So you don't have to give them all, but you have to give a portion of them. You have a hundi, right? So you can put it in the hundi. So if you put it in the hundi, well, we'll just say you put anything in the hundi, money-wise. Then... Uh, when you go home, you'll still be thinking about the hundi because your money's in there. <laughs> it's a very practical way of you give to Krishna and your mind follows the, the thing that you're attached to and then it stays there. Not only that, you feel yourself grow when you give because the more you give, the more you become unencumbered from the idea that that was mine. You give it away and there's an instant relief one feels. Not, maybe not instant. At first there may be a pinch. <laughs> but after you become philosophical on the way home, it's like, why did you give him 2,000? I thought we were only going to give 1,000. Oh, I just got inspired. And Braja Bihari said, you know. And, <laughs> but then later you start to think, well, I feel better. Because now I understand I, this, I'm still being supported by the Supreme Personality of God. It was his money anyway. I, I, I could have lost it anyway at a street corner. Someone could have just told me to hand it over. But I'm lucky, I gave it away first. So there's ample ways in which to find out that what one's meaning is in life through the Bhagavad Gita. And, and it's reasonable. Other approaches to life that don't include the concept of being an instrument and giving everything back to the Supreme Personality of God are frankly a little insane uh, because they don't serve our purposes. They don't bring us happiness. They don't bring the world happiness or success. But this kind of cooperation based on well-reasoned faith, understanding what my actual constitutional and existential position is, that it actually works. This philosophy actually works. And if you take the very basic premise, and that is that I'm a servant of God, and you simply apply that in all the aspects of your life, try to find out what God wants me to do. And then you just try to do that. And even if you can't do it perfectly, I'll just give you an example really quick, even though we have only three minutes. This is from Bhagavad Gita 331. 
This verse, when you hear it, and the purport especially, is going to make you so happy that when you walk out of here, you'll be dancing. And everyone you meet, when you interact, and when you go back to your work, you'll be the jolliest person that they ever met. And they say, what happened? You say, I read this in the Bhagavad Gita. And then you'll pull out one of your 108 Bhagavad Gitas. <laughs> you say, this is it. So Krishna says, 331, those persons who execute their duties according to my injunctions and who follow this teaching faithfully without envy become free from the bondage of fruit of actions. So part of being an instrument is finding out what the instruction is and just following it. Just like the clerk at the bank. He has his instructions, he follows them, he's fine. Here's Prabhupada's purport. The injunction of the Supreme Personality of God at Krishna is the essence of all Vedic wisdom and therefore is eternally true without exception. As the Vedas are eternal, so this truth of Krishna consciousness is also eternal. One should have firm faith in, in this injunction without envying the Lord. There are many philosophers who write comments on the Bhagavad Gita but have no faith in Krishna. They will never be liberated from the bondage of fruit of action. But an ordinary man with firm faith in the eternal injunctions of the Lord, even though unable to execute those orders, becomes liberated from the bondage of the law of karma. In the beginning of Krishna consciousness, one may not fully discharge the injunctions of the Lord, but because one is not resentful of this principle and works sincerely without consideration of defeat and hopelessness, he will surely be promoted to the stage of pure Krishna consciousness. So the principle itself, the inner acceptance that I am the servant, I am an instrument of the Supreme, is so effective that even if you're not able to enact it perfectly in the beginning, or do so very imperfectly, you'll still come to the perfectional stage by holding on to that principle as your main guiding principle in life. Marman, not to the Armarman, not to the Armarman, not to the Armarman, hey, not to the Armarman, not to the Armarman, not to the Armarman, not to the Armarman.